Welcome to C3 San Diego. Need something fresh, real, and powerful in your life? Connect with us on social media, get live stream service notifications, podcasts, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We are so glad you're joining us for a powerful, life-transforming message from one of our C3 San Diego pastors. We would love to hear about how God is impacting your life through this ministry. Please share your experience with us at info at c3sandiego.com. If you'd like to be a part of what C3 Church is doing in the city of San Diego and beyond, you can contribute financially by going to c3give.com and choosing the giving option that works best for you. We hope you enjoy this message. Anyway, come with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, hold the horse while I get on, is the third book of the New Testament, Luke. Luke chapter 15 is a great, great chapter. It's a chapter of uh, three parables that Jesus tells. Three parables Jesus tells. The first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. That's the one we're going to focus on. The sheep just gets lost because it strays. It, man, it just kind of follows whatever. And, uh, and it gets lost. And so Jesus goes on a rescue mission. The second one is the parable of the lost coin, where for no fault of its own, the coin gets lost. Somebody else who was meant to be a steward, or meant to be kind of looking after the thing, didn't look after it properly and lost it. And, and so there's a recovery effort that, that takes place. And there's a lot of people can fit into one of these three stories that maybe maybe somebody who was meant to look after you, didn't do a good job or had authority over you and misused or abused that authority. And before you know it, you're lost. You need to understand God is on a rescue mission to get you back. And then the third one is the parable of the lost son. And the lost son decides, I don't want to live in this house. I don't want nothing to do with the father of this house. Just give me what's mine. I'm going to Vegas to party. And, uh, and he found that what happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas, but stains your soul. And, uh, and he's like, oh, man, what, what am I going to do now? And, uh, but in all three stories, there's a rescue mission. And, uh, and so we're going to just focus on the first one. So come with me, Luke chapter 15. The title of this message is God Optics. God Optics. The reason I chose that title is because how you see God affects everything in your life. The devil knows that how you see or perceive God is going to affect everything in your life. In Matthew 25, there's a parable called the parable of the talents. One guy's given five talents, another two, another one. The guy with the five goes out and trades with them and produces five more. The Bible says he can't wait for his master to come back. And he says, master, look, look, you gave me five talents. I traded with them and I produced five more. And he was so excited to share the news with the master. Well, the master was just as excited. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Man, you were faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over many things. Take charge of 10 cities. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, the guy who got two talents said, oh, 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 master, you also gave me two talents. I also invested them. And look, I produced two more. And the master says to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler. You're going to lo- take charge over four cities. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The last guy that got one didn't do anything with it. He said, what I did was I hit it in the ground because I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I hid your money into the ground. Isn't that amazing? It's like they're talking about two different people. Because when I read the first guy's response and the second guy's response, I find it hard to believe how this guy could even come up with an idea or a concept that somehow this, if you think that God is a hard man, if you think that God is an unfair God, if you think that God is a cruel, capricious nasty, indifferent, vindictive God. Let me tell you, it will affect. It will affect how you walk with Him. It will affect your behavior. It will affect your faith. The devil knows this. That's why his opening line in Scripture is, has God really said? Can you really trust God? Like, (laughs) you, you, you really think that He's for you? God knows the day you eat off that tree, you'll be like Him. He don't want you to be like him. He's holding out on you. If I was you, I'd take matters into your own hands. I'd go your own way. Go maverick. 
You, you can't trust God for your best. If you're going to live your best life, you've got to do it independent of God. Adam and Eve had a warped view. Right there, they got a warped view and the devil's been doing it ever since. But tonight we're going to have a look at this scripture and we're going to smash the devil's lies. We're going to break the devil's lies with some God optics so that you can see God as He really is. So Luke chapter 15 verse 1 says, And all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Him to hear Him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained. Can I just say it's a good thing when religious people complain. I honestly reckon the church isn't doing anything good unless religious people are complaining. Now, if anyone ever says to you, you've got a religious spirit, I need you to understand that's not a compliment. That's not a compliment. God was not in heaven saying, Jesus, there's not enough war in the earth. Why don't you go down there and start another religion? The world didn't need another religion. In fact, Jesus came to fulfill the religious requirements of the law so that Jesus could not start another religion, but so he could restore what was broken and lost in Eden. And that wasn't religion. It was relationship. It was relationship. Adam didn't have to bow five times a day facing ease. Adam didn't have to climb steps. He didn't have to go through this program or that program. All he had to do was walk with God in the cool of the day. He had fellowship and relationship with God. God did not create man because he wanted to to start a religion. God created man because God wanted to have family. God wanted to have relationship. It was relationship that was lost. And so the Pharisees... And the scribes are ticked off that Jesus is welcoming tax collectors and sinners because they felt like they had a corner on God. They they felt like they had so many people who were excluded so they could look like they were better than everybody else. Uh, You know, they were the holier than thou club. They were the chosen frozen. And everybody else was outside. But here Jesus was just hanging out with ordinary people, sharing the love of God because God loves people. Anyway, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven. Everyone say more joy in heaven. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. I love that. Jesus was, was taking him to school. Let me give you three Optics that you want to make sure that you get right about God. The first one is that God is a seeker. God is a seeker. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, what man of you having a hundred sheep if he loses one of them doesn't immediately leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And they're all like, oh. Because number one, first of all, they don't notice the difference between 99 and 100 sheep, because sheep are kind of wandering and grazing. It's a little hard. Hang on, there's one missing. It's hard to tell. But Jesus is trying to say, God knows when one is missing. God knows when just, God's heart aches when just one is missing. God notices, God notices the little things. Can I just tell you, God is not a 99% God. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish. 2 Peter 3 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge. God's not willing that any should perish. God is not happy with 99% of you. He wants all of you. He wants all of you. But you need to understand that, that God is the seeker. I know that we have a thing, and God bless them, we have seeker-friendly churches. And in seeker-friendly, most seeker-friendly churches, what we do is we, we, we say, God, now listen. A little bit awkward. Service is about to start. And what we need you to do is we need you to behave. So we're going to put you behind the curtain. And no, 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 don't come out from the curtain. Because, God, what are you? Oh, listen. All right, let me explain it. If you come out from behind that curtain, you're going to turn them off. We're trying to get them attracted to you. Quick, go right. And so that's, that's, but we don't do it that way. 
But I would tell you that we are a seeker-friendly church. The difference is we actually believe that God is the seeker. So we want to create an atmosphere that is friendly for God who is seeking to deliver you, God who is seeking to heal you, God is see- who is seeking to have relationship and fellowship with you, God who is seeking to set you free from those fears, those anxieties, those phobias, God who is seeking to deliver you from that bondage, those chains, those addictions, God who wants to take you out of the miry clay, set your feet upon a rock, put a new song on the ears. We want to create an atmosphere where the seeker, it, when Adam and Eve sinned, When Adam and Eve sinned, it was God that came. When Adam and Eve sinned, they lost fellowship. They lost relationship with God. Adam and Eve's response was shame, quick, so fig leaves together and hide amongst the trees. They were were the first Enviro people. They're hiding amongst the trees with covered in leaves trying to blend in. Maybe he doesn't notice. But at the very moment that they sinned, God felt the tear of the separation. And God immediately comes, Adam! Adam, where are you? God comes immediately because God is the seeker. Jesus says, I came to seek and to save them that are lost. You need to understand that the the whole purpose of Jesus was rescue mission. The whole assignment of Jesus was a rescue mission. He came to seek and to save. He came to seek and to save them that are lost. God is a seeker. Many years ago, I remember, you know, Arnold Station Wagon, excuse me, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I was elected to lead, not to read. <coughs> Sorry, that's from The Simpsons. I don't even. <laughs> it was in, a, in a, uh, a bunch of movies called The Terminator. The Terminator. Get in the chopper, there's a bomb in there. <laughs> so he comes and he's looking for Sarah Connor. He's looking for Sarah Connor because in, in, in the way this script happens is that John Connor, the son of Sarah Connor, is the one who leads the rebellion where the humans smash the, 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 uh, uh, the robots, the AIs that, that try to rule the world. And so, so they send a Terminator droid back in time because if he can kill Sarah Connor, then he can prevent John Connor from being born and then the robots can rule. And so it's his whole thing. So he comes back and, and there's one scene where Sarah Connor is freaking out and Reese, the guy who's sent back, is trying to save her. And then finally, and she bites him and, you know, is trying to run away and he grabs her and he says, listen, this is, this is a, a Terminator droid, a 1001 model. He can't be dealt with. He can't be bargained with. He doesn't feel pain or remorse or pity, and he will never stop until you're dead. (laughs) And when I heard that, I thought, that is so like Jesus, except he will not stop until you're born again. You need to understand that God is relentless. He is relentless. He is relentless in his pursuit of you. The devil can't deal. The devil can't bargain. There's nothing the devil can say to him to dissuade him. He is coming after you. Even the fact that you're here tonight, you need to understand he's working behind the scenes, setting things up. How do I know this? Because I got saved on a beach. I didn't get saved in church. God knew there was no way in my past I was ever going to walk into the doors of a church that God orchestrated. This, this thing where I thought I was trying to get a sponsorship deal so I could end up being a pro surfer. Instead, I have an encounter with Jesus Christ on a beach on the south coast of Australia that just completely changes my life. 33 years ago, God left the house and He chased me down on a beach. I'm telling you, God is a pursuing God. God is relentless in His pursuit of you and He will not quit. He will not back up. He will not give up till He's got you in the middle of His purpose. I remember years ago, uh, a young lady, friend of ours, she, uh, she decided that, that she'd had enough of God. She wanted to get away from God. She wanted to backslide. And, and so she, she tried everything and she said she just kept running into God. So she, she sold all that she had, just a few meager possessions, a car and stuff. And she bought a one-way ticket to England. She lined up a job before she left over. She was going to work for a, a company over there. When she got there, she was so miffed because her boss was a Christian and invited her to church. And she's like, I'm trying to run away from God. And so she had temporary accommodation. They have these temp housing 
And uh, so she, she was going through the, the local paper and then she finds the perfect place right near Oxford Street where all the shopping is. And she's like, oh, this is am- amazing. Two, two girls, one a third person, a roommate in this awesome studio apartment. It's got, you know, kind of levels and everything on there. She goes, she loves it. This is incredible. Only to find both girls are Christians. She said no matter where she went, no matter what she did, she recognized God was not going to let her go. God was not going to let her go. God was not. She may have let go of him, but he hadn't let go of her. He was chasing her down. I don't know where you are tonight, but I want you to know that God is a seeker. God is not seeking you to make a slave or a servant of you. God is seeking you to restore you back to being a son or a daughter in his family. That's why God is seeking you. He's seeking you because he knows that outside of him, nobody has the best interest. Only God has the very, very best plan and purpose for your life. Can somebody say, Amen. God is a seeker God. He's just that good. I love the story of Jonah. You know, Jonah decides, God tells him, go to Nineveh and and prophesy there. And and he's just like, you know what? Uh, I'm too young for this stuff. I'm just a young buck. And, you know, all of a sudden now I'm a prophet and God wants me to go and start my, he goes, you know what? Instead, it's spring break. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go spring break, spring break partying in Tarshish. So the Bible says he goes down to Joppa. And if you actually study, Tarshish was a party city. It was full of exotic animals. It was a seaside community. It had the most amazing, you know, clubs and aqueducts and restaurants and everything in that day. And so he decides he's going to go to Tarshish to party because he doesn't want to start accepting responsibility. Well, if you know the story, he's on a boat and uh, God has wonderful ways of persuading us that just maybe you ought to reconsider your choices. Maybe that's not the smartest option. And so a giant, giant storm comes and, you know, it starts crashing into the boat and the boat is getting rocked on the seas. And the Bible says the mariners cry out to their false gods and there's no answer. There's no deliverance. And, and so it gets that bad that they start throwing their cargo overboard. Now, you know, when, when, when mariners are throwing their cargo, because they get paid for delivering cargo from port A to port B. And if they're throwing off their payment, you know that they're so desperate. They're right now, we don't care if we don't get paid. We just want to live. And then one of the guys taps him and says, hey, well, why is there this dude sleeping down in the hole? And they're like, what? So they go down, wake up, sleeper. Call on your God. Maybe your God can do something. And then Jonah gets up and says, listen, it's my fault. And they're like, how's this your fault? He says, well, I'm a prophet of the Lord. And God told me to go to Nineveh and I'm in rebellion. And they're like, oh, well, what do we do? And he says, throw me overboard. They're like, what? He's like, if you throw me overboard, the the sea will be calm for you. All of you will survive. They're like, but you'll drown. He says, well, you've got to throw me overboard. Otherwise, we're all going to drown. And uh, they kind of get in a little holy huddle and they come back and they say, listen. (laughs) Colin already knows where this is going. (laughs) They say, listen, we're men from Joppa. We're men of principle. We have a motto. He who pays the fare, we will get them there. <laughs> Jonah, we, we don't throw passengers overboard. And Jonah goes, listen, I'm not, I'm not sure if you've ever drowned. He says, but you're under the water. You're struggling trying to get up. The current is dragging you under. Finally, when your lungs feel like they, they can't hold out any longer. You <gasps> breathe in, but you, there's no air. It's water and lo- water and <laughs> and, every, and little, little Abdul says, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't. and they're like, shut up, Abdul. And they're like, man, that is terrible. Well, that is crazy, man. Oh, hang on, give us a second. They huddle it again. They come back and they say, man, drowning sounds horrible. But we're men from Joppa, men of principle. We've got a motto. He who pays the fare, we will get them there. <laughs> and Jonah's like, man, listen, drown, drowning would be the, the easy option. This is the open ocean. Do you know what kind of do do you know what kind of creatures are out there? He says, with a shipwreck, there's going to be bleeding. There's going to be sharks that are going to come. And, and, and sharks don't take you all at once. They'll circle you and then they'll come in and take a leg. Ah, oh, there goes a leg. And then another one. It's the most painful way to die. And little, I don't want to die. But they're like, shut up, Abdul, will you? Goodness gracious. So they huddle again. They're like, man, Jonah, that sounds terrible. Terrible. Oh, man. We're men from Joppa. (laughs) Men of principle, we've got a motto. He who pays the fare, 
we will get them there. And Jonah's like, guys, take out your wallets. They're like, he is a man of God. He's taking an offering. He's like, no, 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 no. He says, open your wallets and have a look at the pictures. And they're looking at their little wives and their children and little, oh, that's my wife, that's my little Ranjit. Oh, like, you know, and uh, he's like, you'll never see them again. If you don't throw me overboard, you'll never see your wives, your children, your lover. You gotta throw me overboard. Oh, they get in a huddle and come back and they're like, we might drown, we might be torn apart by sharks and we may never see our families again, but we're men from Joppa. <laughs> men of principle. We've got a motto, he who pays the fare, we will get them there. Jonah says, man, it's an honour to die with such men of principle. If you're looking for me, I'm going to be down in the hull listening to Katy Perry. They said, what? What, what will you be listening to? He said, Katy Perry. They said, right, one, <laughs> two. And they throw, now I'm not sure if that's exactly how it happened, but anyway, so they throw... <laughs> I kissed a girl. And anyway, and so they throw him overboard. They throw him overboard. Now he's in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a storm. Giant waves as the, 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 the boat leaves. Now, I used to think it was part of God's judgment that a giant fish comes and if it couldn't get worse, it does. A giant fish oh, swallows Jonah. And I used to think, that's part of God's judgment. But God actually said, no, 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 you read the Bible with eyes of punishment. I didn't send the fish to punish Jonah. I sent the fish to preserve Jonah. Because he wouldn't be able to tread water long enough. He would perish and his destiny and his calling would perish with him. So I prepared a fish beforehand to swallow Jonah to give him safe passage. See, Jonah had rejected God, was in rebellion from God, was running away from God, had, had didn't want anything to do. The Bible says he was even doing this to get away from the prayer. Even though Jonah had rejected God and was running from God, God had never left him. God's thoughts had never departed from him. God was even preparing a fish in the midst of his rebellion, in the midst of his rejection, in the midst of his backsliding, God prepares a fish Jonah, it takes Jonah three days. That's what guilt, shame, and condemnation will do. It'll ruin your God optics. It takes him, and then finally after three days, he realizes, hang on, God is a gracious God. He prays once, and God says to the fish, spit him up. And the fish goes, bye, and, and Jonah comes out, and he looks up, and Nineveh just, it's, and he's there at Nineveh. The Bible says he walks up the beach preaching, repent, and everybody repents. Some say it could have been the smell. For three days, he's been in the stomach acid juices, or maybe he was just like completely bleached white, you know, and he's kind of walking up all crazed. But let me tell you, his test became a testimony People are like, if, if God can keep a guy alive in the belly of a fish for three days, we better do what he says. So from the king all the way down to, the, to the, the, the beggar at the gate, they repented, put on sackcloth and ashes, and an entire city was saved. I want you to know that God is a seeker God. He is seeking you. He is relentless in his pursuit of you. You may let go of him, but he will never let go of you. Can somebody say amen? The second thing about God, moving a little bit quicker, the second thing about God is that God is a lifter. God is a lifter. Have a look what it says. It says that he leaves the 99 to go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, and when he has found it, have a look what it says. And when he has found it, he lays his boot into it and says, you filthy sheep, you got to burn it out. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. That doesn't say that at all. I don't even know where that came from. Excuse me. It says, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Interesting. So the sheep is lost. We have these street preachers that get out there and they tell people, repent, you got to burn in hell. And we wonder why people aren't running towards God. 
God's going to send you to hell, you filthy sinners. Because all have sinned. All have sinned. And if you know that God's got a, a giant big stick, you know, if you perceive that God is the mighty smiter, and Gabriel's like, God, what are you doing with that stick? Shh, Gabriel. It's not a stick. It's a smiting rod. And I'm just waiting for one of them to color outside the lines. I'm waiting for just one of them to slip up and pow! I'll smite them with a mighty smite. <laughs> I, I, I wonder why our evangelism's not effective. Oh, I get where you're going, preacher. There is no hell. No, no, th no, there is a hell. There is a hell. Like, Jesus wouldn't have gone through what he went through if there was no hell to rescue you from. But let me, let me just say this. If you end up in hell, you paddled your own canoe. I'm telling you, God has sent rescue after rescue after rescue after rescue after rescue after rescue. If you end up there, it's because you said, no, thank no. you. Re but, but let me just say this. God had a, cho God had a choice. God had a choice. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If God's intention was for you and I to go to hell, he could have easily have done that. Instead, he chose the nails and the crucifixion and the cross. When God came to a crossroad and one option was you and I to burn in hell for all eternity, God says, no, give me the cross. Give me the shame. Give me the crucifixion. Give me the crown of thorns in my head. Give me the beating by the Romans. Give me, give me the, the nails in my wrist, the nails through my feet. G give me the cross. Give me the cross. He came to save you. Most people think that God is the happy Gilmore God. That when he finds the sheep, the, the sheep that has wandered off, it's, it's cut, it's bleeding, it's dirty, it's filthy, that he comes up and he grabs the sheep. He says, what's the matter, sheep? Too good for your home? Why won't you go home? He's not the happy Gilmore God. He doesn't say to the sheep, I'm going to rub your face and you'll oh, think you're better than the rest, do you? Just wander off and do your own. He doesn't. The Bible says when he finds the sheep which is lost, he doesn't kick it. He doesn't condemn it. He doesn't rub its face in it. Dirty, bloody. He picks the sheep up. He puts it on his shoulders. Rejoicing. The Spirit is rejoicing. The Spirit is not, just you and I got to do the reason. That's not the Spirit. The Spirit is rejoicing. Picks you up. We have a God who lifts you out of the miry clay, sets your feet upon a rock, yes. makes your footsteps firm, puts a new song, a song of salvation on the inside of you. He picks people up every day out of their drug habits. He picks people up every day out of their alcoholism. He picks people up every day out of their addictions. He picks people up out of their bondage, out of their sin, out of their depravity, out of their brokenness, out of their hurting, out of their luck. He picks them up every day. He picks them up. He picks them up and he puts them on his shoulders. I, I've had four kids and all of my kids, I'm not sure what it is, they go through a season where they decide legs should be optional. We would get to the moment like, Daddy! Daddy! Pick me up! Legs not working! And I'm like, Jordan, you're 23. No, that's not true. That's not true. That didn't happen. Where is he? I've just, oh, oops, sorry, Geordie. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. That's not true. That's not true. He was 22. No, 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 no. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. Hey, the truth is, the truth is, we won a running, we won a, a running race. I'm not sure if Geordie can remember this. He was about five or six. And we're at his school, Oxford Falls Grammar School. And Leanne says, oh, you got to go, you know, take time off work, book, book in. They've got the carnival on. And, you know, the, the little guys, they, they 
run in all these athletic things and they don't let them throw javelins. I don't know why I did that. But anyway, they, they, they do other things. And uh, imagine that, six, throwing a javelin. You know, two teachers were found. It was like, anyway, no, that's not what happened. That's not. And, uh, but anyway, they, 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 they decide at the end of the day, they're going to have this parents, uh, parents running with one of the children either on their back in a piggyback race or on their shoulders. And so Geordie climbs up on my shoulders. And so Leanne's like, you got to do it. So, so I line up and, you know, I'm kind of lined up and Geordie's up there and I'm looking at the other people's kids. And I'm thinking, you yeah, know, not bad, but check that out. And, uh, you know, because every parent's more proud of their kid than, anyway. And so, you know, I'm, you know, he's a good looking little kid and I've got him up there. And then I notice that I'm the only male. Like, it's, it's all mums with their kids and then me. So I look at Leanne on the sideline. I'm like, you're meant to be in this. She's like, no, you're right. I'm like, no. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and they're like, you know, when the gun goes, there's a hundred meter dash. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, this is not even. And I'm thought, I don't want to be one of those parents that, you know, sprint and, ha! you know, like, you know. So, so what I did was I, I decided, you know, let the gun go. And I give them all a 10 yard head start, 10 yard head start. And the goal was to give them a 10 yard head start, you know, and then run them down. So at least I felt like I, you know, I was fair. I gave him a head start and then mowed him down. That, that was the plan. That was the, that was the plan. Anyway, the gun goes off. All the ladies start running. And uh, it's obvious that most of them haven't run with a, you know, with a child on their back. And, you know, uh, and uh, anyway, the lady in the front of the pack falls. <laughs> and the next minute... It's like, I don't know why I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. This is really bad. Like I'm laughing at people. Anyway, so, so, so I just literally just ran through. And I think I finished and it was like four or five minutes later till the next person. I don't know why I told you. Anyway, God, God is a lifter. How I got into that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that, but God... <laughs> See if I can rope it in. God, God wants to get you to the finish line. God. God lifts up the sheep, puts it on his shoulders and carries it back. He doesn't point the way back. He doesn't give you a map to the way back. When you get saved, you don't, you don't understand God doesn't say, right, I've saved you now. Stop it and try harder. Here's a Bible. It's like a GPS of where you ought to be now. Do better. And if you don't, I'll be watching. Don't make me come down there again. Like that's how a lot of people see. But I, I got to tell you that, that I've, I've discovered God is a God that not just picked me up on the beach, but honestly has carried me again and again and again. And every time I've strayed, He's come and He's picked me back up and said, son, wrong direction. Come on. This is where you're meant to be. This is your flock, this is your tribe, this is your family, this is your calling, this is your purpose, this is your destiny. He's a seeker God, but he's a lifter God. And the third one, he's a celebrating God. He's a celebrating God. Have a look at what it says. It says, and when he gets the sheep home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. Like, just imagine, you're sitting at home, phone rings, and hello? Oh, hey, Bob, how you doing? What? Who is it? it it's Bob. What's he want? Uh, his sheep was lost, is found, and now there's a party at his house. <laughs> Bob, have you been drinking? How long have you been in the sun? Did you hit your head on anything? Like... Bob, sheep go lost every day. Are you going to throw a party? God. See, Jesus says that this God notices when one is missing from the 99. He immediately leaves the 99 to go after one. Do you know how valuable you are to God? The devil's a liar. He wants you to believe that God can do with losing one. 
you know, their say, the people behind you, and he loves that person next to you, and he loves that person in front of you, but he, come on, he knows your weaknesses and yours. He couldn't. The devil's a liar. The devil is a liar. Jesus leaves a 99 who need no repentance to go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he finds it, he's always successful. And when he finds it, he picks it up. He puts it on his shoulders and he carries it back. And when he gets it back, he calls together his neighbors and his friends saying, rejoice with me. Party. We're going to celebrate. You know why? Because your life is worth celebrating. Your life is worth celebrating. The, the, the most empty life is a life that sits alone on its birthday. The day you were born, the world got a little bit brighter. Do you know out of 7.2 billion people, there's not another you? You're the only copy of you walking around. God so loves you. He wants you to understand you are so valuable to Him that God throws a party. When you got saved, when you get saved, the Bible says there's more joy in heaven, which is kind of crazy because I kind of, you know, when those people that have their near-death experience, they say, man, when they got there, there was like joy inexpressible. So it's like the, the joy onometer is already set on 10. But it's like when one person gets saved, God magically puts an 11. It's like spinal tap. So all of a sudden there's an 11. And God goes, go ahead. And the angel's like, may I? You may right now. 11 is for times like this. And so they turn the level of joy up and it goes from 10 to 11. When just one sinner, when just one person gets saved. And the Bible says all the angels are rejoicing. You know why the angels are rejoicing? Because the Bible again teaches that the day you were born or even before you were born, when you were conceived, God appointed guardian angels. We know, we know it's plural, it's at least two, could be more, angels, plural. And their job, the Bible says in Hebrews, is to fight for your salvation. So the day that you give your life to Jesus, those angels enter into heaven and all the angels are standing in a standing ovation, clapping, high-fiving them as they come in, cheering and chanting their name because it is mission accomplished. They're chest bumping, fist bumping, elbow, the whole thing because mission accomplished. Their assignment, their job was from conception to get you to the place where you are born again. You're now following. And Jesus says at that moment, God throws a party in heaven because your life is worth celebrating. Do you know what? I love the fact that the people give us a hard time at C3. And I listen to what they say. One of the things they say is that C3 is like a constant party. I'm like, thank you. Guilty. Guilty as charged. Yeah, they don't take things seriously. They're always having fun. Guilty. Guilty as charged. I think they do way too much celebrating. Guilty. In fact, if I was really honest with you, I actually feel like we under-celebrate people. I feel that we under-celebrate people. Now, you need to understand that Leanne and I are so appreciative of not just what God has done in our life, but the extraordinary people that He's surrounded us with. And we've made a, a determination that every single person, every single person who volunteers and every single person who's on our team and sacrifices, that what we want to do is we want to make sure that they are celebrated. Their birthdays are celebrated. Their wedding days are celebrated. We want to celebrate. We want you to know that your life is worth celebrating. Religion hates celebration. Moses brought the law down from the mountain. And his first miracle was he turned water into blood. And it was God showing a picture that the law can only produce death. Not one of us can get into heaven by keeping the law. The law came to show us that not one of us can be perfect. The law is God's perfect standard and you and I are all violators of God's perfect standard. So when Jesus comes as God's grace and truth, he turns water into wine. First miracle. The law of first mentions is of all the miracles for Jesus to launch his ministry, for him to brand himself. He didn't raise the dead. 
He's the resurrection God. He didn't open the eyes of the blind. He's a God of vision. He, he didn't cleanse a leper. He's the God that can cleanse the deepest wounds in the sky. First miracle he does, he's at a wedding and they run out of wine. And his mama comes, she goes, son, they've run out of wine. And he, you know, maybe made a mistake. I don't know. He goes, woman, what is your concern? I mean, he's with his boss. He's trying to impress them. Woman, what does thou concern have to do with me? She's like, what, 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 what did you just say? <laughs> oh, oh, you, you're saying it ain't your time yet? And you want to call me woman? You know what? If it ain't your time, but it's time enough to call me, if it's time enough for you to call me woman, it's time. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Get those wash piles. You're starting your miracles today. Won't call me woman. And uh, I'm your mama. Don't you forget that. And so... Jesus turns water into wine. For 2,000 years, Baptists will be trying to turn it back into water again. He's a risky God. He's a party God. He's a celebration God. Thank you so much for joining us online. We hope you had a powerful experience. We want to take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. If you made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, go to our website, c3sandiego.com. And if you didn't get a chance to give online during service and would like to contribute financially, you can go to c3give.com and click on the giving option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you. See you at church.